scripture, Mark chapter 4. You know, some of us old enough to remember when they didn't have air conditioning, right? <laughs> and God's word still spoke anyway. Anyway, Mark chapter 4, we'll just do 26 to 29. He also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise at night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is this... Uh, Preschool teacher teaching three-year-olds how to learn, to learn the names of animals. She held up a picture of a cat. They, the kid said, that's a cat. Picture of a dog, that's a dog. Now this was an inner city group of children. And she held up a picture of a deer. And they didn't know what it was, they just stared. And uh, the teacher said, well just think about what your mother says to your father, what she calls him. <laughs> and at this point, the little girl says, so that's what a baboon looks like. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, uh, so many people have distorted image of you. And instead of seeing you as a deer, we see you as a baboon. Instead of seeing you as you are, we see you as something you're not. I pray, Lord, with the scripture today. You help us to see you clearer. Help us to have your eyes, Father's eyes. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it was 1909. It was Mother's Day. And Sonora Smart Dodd was sitting in the congregation in Spokane, Washington, listening to a great Mother's Day sermon. But she had trouble thinking about her mother because her mother died, died giving birth to the sixth child in the family. And her father was both father and mother to her through the years. And so after the service, she asked the father, I mean, asked the pastor, would you mind preaching a sermon honoring fathers and do it in June because my father's birthday will be in June. So he did. And that was the beginning of Father's Day. Now, Mother's Day has always taken off faster than Father's Day. I mean, Mother's Day became a national holiday in 1914, 98 years ago. But it wasn't until 40 years ago today, 1972, that Father's Day became a holiday, national holiday. Now, Mother's Day took off in other ways too. I mean, it was the number one, still is the number one day for, for phone calls, for uh, flowers, for candy, for cards, everything. The only thing Father's Day used to be noted for, now everyone has cell phones, but it used to be known as the number one day of collect phone calls. Uh, <laughs> Mother's Day tend to have the better of the two, you know? Um, now add to that, the church uh, does not recognize Mother's Day and Father's Day as Christian holidays. They are secular holidays. They are Walmart, I mean Hallmark holidays. <laughs> they are business holidays. But yet we as a church find the Christian thing to do to honor our fathers and mothers as the commandments command us to do that. And, and as I was getting ready for the day, actually starting last summer, the scripture spoke to me about Father's Day. Because what does God do? In, this, in the parable, God is sowing the seed. In all the parables of Jesus, the main person, you remember, is God. He's the one sowing the seed in this case. What is the seed? Elsewhere, uh, uh, Jesus says the seed is the word of God. And he says it very plainly. Uh, in another parable, he says, some receive it, some have like stones, others have weeds, others have, don't receive it at all. The seed is the word of God. Now, mothers and fathers, we are the most critical means through which God's seed is sown. How can I say that? When father and mother together are actively involved in the church and take their children to worship, whether they want to go or not. Doesn't matter the church, doesn't matter if it's interesting or not, doesn't matter if the kids fight and scream or not. If they're drugged to church, they have a 75% chance of continuing to grow in faith. Now, if the father only does it, 
without the mother, there's a 50% chance of success. Now this is a shocker. If the mother does it only, without the father, the success rate drops to 15%. If neither go to church but send their children to church, it drops to 9%. And if neither go, the odds of success of a child growing in faith drops down to practically zero. Now, why the big disparity between 50% for fathers and 15% for mothers? The reason is children expect mothers to do those type things, the nurturing things. They don't expect it from fathers. So when a father stops and does a nurturing thing, such as take a child, the child notices. This must be important if dad's going to stop and do that. That's why it's very important to fathers. Actually, it's important for both because 75% if both of us do it together. Now, that's one thing to say a person will continue to grow in faith. But remember the other part of that. As we looked at a few weeks ago, people who attend worship on a regular basis as a whole, are healthier physically and mentally and relationally and emotionally, have fewer problems, less stress, less medication, live longer, twice as likely to live longer, etc., etc., etc. So when we help God sow the seeds of God's Word, the faith, and our children, we're helping our children in every way possible. Now, it's not just enough to bring our children to church, fathers and mothers. It's also important how we live our faith and our relationship with our children. And I know a lot of you have heard this, that if a child lives with criticism, the child learns to condemn. Lives with hostility, learns to fight. Lives with ridicule, becomes shy. With shame, feels guilty. But on the other hand, if a child lives with tolerance, becomes patient. With encouragement, becomes confident. Lives with praise, learn to appreciate. Lives with fairness, learns to be just. Lives with security, learns to have faith. Lives with approval, learns to like him or herself. Lives with acceptance and friendship, learns to find love in the world. Which means then, it's not just enough to bring people to worship. We have to live our faith, such as to communicate the presence of Christ uh, to our children. Uh, Paul puts it this way. In Ephesians chapter 6, he says in verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Now, children are going to get angry when we discipline them. They're going to get upset when we say, no, we can't do this. It's something that's going to hurt them. That's, that's one thing. But to provoke a child to anger, that's something else. And he says, don't provoke them to anger. That's not necessary. But bring them up in the teachings and the instructions of the Lord. It's important. For us to be the means of God's grace, for God's word, the seed of God, to be planted in our children. Now, how can we improve to be a parent? How can any of us be improved being in our husbands and wives, uh, to improve in our workplace? You know, there are a lot, an awful lot of good self-help books, good communication books, and I find them very helpful. But the biggest shock for me <laughs> was to find that the most effective way in improving our relationship with our family, with people we work with, etc., is to improve our relationship with the family with whom we grew up. How's that? You see, I think Jesus wants to sow a seed of healing in our lives. If there is still unresolved tension within the family that we grew up, it's going to carry over in our relationships. And that, more than anything else, other than skills that we learn, is going to be what's communicated. For instance, um, I really looked up to Dad growing up. I idolized him. I was proud when he became cub uh, master of our Cub Scout pack. And I was proud when uh, he became president of the local postal clerks union in the, in the state and then the southeast. I was proud of a lot of things that he did. But I had an underlying anger and resentment for many years. And when I learned about this, I said, you know, I, I've got to deal with this. Now, how do you deal with it with someone who has already passed away? And he's passed away. Well, I began to figure, where did all this occur? It occurred when I was eight. 
My brother Tommy was six, my brother Jimmy was four, and my sister was just born, Kathy Lynn. And what had happened, looking back on it and realize what really happened, was having six people at the household couldn't afford the finances from the farm. And that's all he really wanted to do was to be a farmer. So he had to get a job. And I remember us being so excited when he got the job at the post office. But being the youngest one there, the newest one on the block, he had to work the graveyard shift. So he had to sleep when we were awake. And in a small house of, that couldn't really hold six people, uh, and especially if it's raining outside and you can't go outside, as kids, we were noisy. So he had to begin to discipline us, make us be quiet when we didn't want to be. We wanted to be kids. And what I eventually began to realize, and I resented, was all the discipline, all the, the, the spankings and whippings. And it just, what happened was we were forced into a situation that none of us wanted because of economics. And what Dad was doing was trying to be a good father, provide for us. He was doing the best he could do. And we as kids, being kids, we probably could have done better, but we were kids doing the best we could. And it was just a natural clash of conflicts. And when I realized that, that it really wasn't out of personality or anything, it was just a clash of the situation we're in, healing began to occur within me. And when it began to occur with me, it was like I began to realize people around me with whom I worked with at that time, including now, definitely some church members, was everyone does pretty much the best they can do. Now, several people can do better, yeah, and we can all improve, yes, but why get upset if people are trying to do the best they can do? And a major healing took place within me, and it had its effect on my relationship with so many other people. If you and I have any kind of unresolved issues with our family that we grew up with, God wants to sow a seed of healing within that family, and that will carry over in everything else in life. Which brings us to the third seed I think God wants to sow. First one is we be the seed of God's grace to our children and others. But the seed of healing in our relationship. The third seed is that God wants us to allow the seed of, of Jesus to grow within us. Now why do I say it that way? Well, if you remember, Jesus identifies the seed as the word of God. John chapter 1 says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. Jesus came to live and dwell within us. And the primary reason is we have these distorted images of God. Some of us see, instead of a deer, we see baboons. And we don't have the proper image. Uh, a couple of weeks ago I showed the book that Kathy wrote, my wife, about God images in the healing process. And, and what she explains in the book very well, and what a lot of us have known for a while, if you look at a person's understanding of God, that can tell you what a person's pretty much that relationship is with their parents, primarily the father. If you see God as a very loving, kind, compassionate, and you feel that, not just know it, but feel it, the odds are you had a very loving, very compassionate parents, especially the Father. But if you see God as someone who doesn't seem to ever answer the prayer, someone who's always distant, there's a very good chance you had parents who were distant, never around, especially the Father. If you see God as very forgiving, and you don't mind to come before God, and you're not embarrassed by the things you've done, that's one thing, and that means you probably have a father who was, and a mother who, were, who was like that. But if you see God as a very strict disciplinarian, uh, someone you are afraid that if you die, you're afraid to appear before, there's a good chance you had that with your father. And, 
And what God wants to do is say, wait a minute, I'm not like any of these images that you've got. If you want to see me, who I really am, look at Jesus and let Jesus live and dwell within you. In John chapter 14, Jesus says to Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So what does God look like then in Jesus? One of those images, and there are a lot of images you can see of Jesus in the Bible, but one of the most important images is that God loves us so much that God comes to us in Jesus. The fact that God came to us in Jesus is one thing, but then Jesus shows that he comes to us seeking lost sheep when we're lost. Seeking us is the pearl of great value because he values us. He's willing to die on the cross. What do we see in Jesus? We see in Jesus a God who cares about us first and foremost, no matter what our past has been. Now, uh, a lot of us know about this guy. Uh, most of us don't know that he was a uh, rebellious college dropout. He was a party goer, carouser. Uh, he kept getting in trouble with drugs and alcohol, kept being thrown into jail. He was like the prodigal son. And in the story of the prodigal son, if you remember, as the prodigal son's coming back, saying, okay, I'm defeated. There's nothing I can do. I need help. And they're going back to the father. And on the way back, he's ready to give the speech. But before he even has a chance to give the speech, the father says, hey, let's have a party. And he has the party. While we yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, this prodigal son, that very famous prodigal son, is named Franklin Graham. His father is Billy Graham. Franklin Graham today has Compassion International, and we participate with that with Operation Christmas Child. And we'll make shoeboxes again this fall. Amy's going to lead us in that. She's already making plans. And that's a prodigal son, a prodigal child returning to God. And God says, I want you to understand I want a relationship with you because I value you. Now, most of us don't know the name, but the name is Philip Yancey. He is considered one of the most influential, especially on evangelical circles, uh, Christian writers. In one of his writings, he tells about an uh, incident uh, in which he's sitting with his mother, and they're going through a shoebox of old photographs. And in this old photograph, he sees a photograph of him at eight months of age with his mother and with his older brother. And the photograph is old, it's black and white, and it's kind of crumpled up. And he says, Mom, why do you still have that photo? Uh, there's so many better photos of us. She says, well, remember your dad had polio? When he was eight months old, his dad had polio. And his polio was so severe, he had to exist on an iron lung. He could not move. He could barely breathe, with, but with the help of the higher lung, he could. And all he could do is just lie there in this iron lung. He wanted a photo of his family. This was the photo. She said, we had to stick it between these knobs in the iron lung in order for it to say, and that's why it's wrinkled. She says, I keep it to remind me of how much he loved us. And Philip writes that here was a man, his father, who was like a stranger to him. Because at eight months, he didn't remember his father. He died four months later. Um, it was like a stranger, an unknown. He said at that moment, all of a sudden, he felt a warmth inside. Like he knew his dad, the same warmth he had the day he accepted Christ into his life, that God really loved him. That's the warmth. That's the image of what God wants us to have. That's the seed that God wants to sow within us today. He wants to live and dwell within us, as John, Jesus says in John 14. So, uh, Time for the rubber to hit the road. Look for ways, fathers and mothers, to sow the seeds, the seeds of God's love. Look for ways 
in which you can seek healing from, with God's help. Look for ways to allow the love of God to continue to grow within you. Will you pray with me? Lord, you have a way of taking things of the secular world and turn them into the sacred. You have a way of taking a, a cross and turning it into something holy. You have a way of taking a secular holiday, a Mother's Day and Father's Day, and turning it into something very sacred. So Lord, I pray that it's not the day that's sacred, but it's you living and dwelling in and through us. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to continue to dwell and continue to guide and continue to heal us, Lord, so that we can be the person that you created us to be, so that when we do die, we'll appear before you and the angels of heaven will say, this child of God has God's eyes, a father's eyes. Looks just like Jesus. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.